Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Dan Barker. I'm co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, a national organization of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate. You can find out more about us at ffrf.us, where we invite you to become a member. Working for secular government is hard enough in the United States, but much more difficult in other parts of the world. Mohammed al Qadra is the founder of Ex-Muslims of Jordan, a group that raises awareness of atheism in the Middle East. Because of his outspoken criticism of religion, Qadra has faced potential arrest by the government, and his life as an atheist has become dangerous. Qadra gave a talk at FFRF's annual convention in San Francisco, and while he was there, FFRF's Director of Communications, Amit Paul, was able to sit down with him for a few moments. Welcome to our show, Free Thought Matters, Mohammed Khadra, and it's uh, wonderful to have you on our show, and you have such a fascinating background. Uh, you were born in the United States, but you're of uh, Jordanian background originally, and uh, you lived much of your life in Jordan. And tell us a bit about yourself and what fascinated me especially was that initially you were quite a uh, fundamentalist, uh, if I may say so. So could you please tell us a bit about that? Thank you for having me. I, we lived in the United States for I think a year after I was born, and then we moved back to Jordan. I, I had a very moderate family, but um, as I grew up more, I began to realize that I'm far away from what the the true faith requires, and uh, then I began searching more, and that that's what led to, as you can you can call it, a more fundamental view, or as I've seen it, is as the much more closer to truth. One of the things that uh, resulted in that is me trying to be a better Muslim, not because I was born into the faith but because, um, based on my own knowledge uh, of it. So that's when I began studying it more, and then that led to the path of uh, being more fundamental about it. To the extent that you were actually somebody who approved of uh, violent jihad, even the September 11th attacks in your perspective were not completely uh, unjustified. Of That's course, there, there's two terms. There's uh, Dar al-Salam and Dar al-Harb. Sure. Dar al-Islam is the, the House of Islam, yeah. which is any uh, area uh, that is, has a majority of Muslims. And yeah. the Dar al-Harb, the House of War, is where uh, they are. They they are a minority, but um, the rule of Sharia does not. Well, it's not the law of the land, and it's not completely justified to go ahead and do so, attacks such as 9-11, but some clerics would, would permit it, and that's what the terrorists of 9-11 believed in. Uh, jihad, uh, it's called uh, Jihad al-Salafi, it means the, the, the Salafist Jihad, sure. uh, which goes back into the age of the Futuh, which are the, the, the conquests of Muslims, and they believe that they should continue in doing so, and it's okay and permitted to attack the house of war. And that, that's basically what I believe in. But when 9-11 happened, I was too young for that. That's, that's sure. my idea about 9-11 when I grew up. But, at, but before that, even when I was a kid, I had enough hate in me to cheer for it. Although I was, I believe, I think I was seven or something. Yeah. I was like, hell yeah, like they, they bombed the Americans. Yeah. And that hate was perfectly normal in the community, in the family, in the, the whole country. Um, then afterwards, after a lot of talking, a lot of preaching, and a lot of um, wars that happened. Then the majority started changing and being like, oh, you know what, maybe we shouldn't have. But it was perfectly normal to, to believe so. And given what you've told us, then it's even more fascinating how uh, you went on this path of non-belief mm -hmm. and you transformed into a free thinker can you tell us a bit about that and uh, what led you to uh, becoming uh, a non-believer the way you are? And I believe Richard Dawkins 
had some part to play in it. So yes. if you could uh, talk about that too. So uh, I began to, I wanted one of two things eventually, either become a preacher or maybe participate in jihad or something like that. I had two friends, one of them did uh, suicide bombing in Fallujah. Wow. The other one went to the civil war in Syria and came back in a wheelchair. Wow. And I had only a feeling of envy toward them. Like they had a purpose in life, they went and they did something. And look at you, you're just sitting in your college desk and you don't, you're, not, you're not fulfilling your destiny or like what, what is required to you by God. So I either wanted to do that or to be a preacher who would bring on those infidels and make new Muslims. And in order to do that, you'll have to convince them. And so uh, my idea was that if I, if I cannot convince anybody if I keep thinking inside the same box, I have to remove myself from the Sunni sect and from the Islamic religion and from all of that and start by proving God and then going back into the circle until I can prove to them like, of course, the Sunni sect is the ultimate truth. And that's what I failed to do because when I went outside of the box and I was, my, my initial plan was proving God. And that's when I was like, okay, let's search about this a little bit. And then I was like, I stumbled on a YouTube video and there was Richard Dawkins about, talking about evolution. And all I can think of is like the, this whole theory, we had it like in a small paragraph in ninth grade, followed by verses after verses of the Quran talking about how wrong this theory would be and then like try they're, they're trying to put those verses in order for us to by ourselves conclude that this is incorrect and uh, so i was wondering why are the there's a large number of people who believe in this although it's absolutely fake so i began watching a video after video of him and then i was like well actually this makes sense and what so usually Atheists who become uh, who come from a Muslim background, uh, they would tell me that they first doubted the sect, then they doubted the religion, then they doubted the existence of God, then they became agnostics, and then they were, had no belief anymore. Mm. For me, I think I I went the opposite way, wow. because I was outside of the box already, and then when I was like, oh, I can't even prove God, mm. but like if I can't even prove the Creator, how can I prove my own sect or my own religion? So I was like, okay, if I went back into this without glorifying it, I will find the flaws. And that's what I did. When I went back, I was like, why couldn't I see this in front of me? It was just because you're, you're so into the dogma, you can't even see something wrong even when it's in front of your eyes. You, can, you read the text and you, you think it's, it's perfectly fine. Oh, beat your women. It's okay. Oh, throw, throw that guy uh, on top of a roof. It's completely okay. Um, you would see things that are like scientifically incorrect. Like you'd see some suggestions that the earth is flat and you, you never wonder what that means. But then when you start waking up, you start questioning and you have that mentality that not everything that I'm going to see is going to be correct. And then flaws begin popping up and that's how I completely abandoned it afterwards. That's, that's so fascinating. Mohammed Khadra, you uh, came for our convention to San Francisco in early November, and uh, your speech uh, spoke about some of these issues. Let's take a look and see what you had to say. When we speak of how religion has control of all aspects of life in the Middle East, we describe censorship, blasphemy laws, lack of liberty and freedom of thought. It's usually considered as if it has always been the case, as if Islam has had this power all along. That's not quite correct. When we look back into the 60s, you'd find, for example, publications that no one would dare write now. And even if they do, publishers would not dare to publish them in those countries. And even <clears throat> people used to dress, act, and think differently. Leaders would openly criticize the idea of having religion back in introduced back into politics. There was even a relative respect for women a period of secular societies and daring conversations on subjects that now can get you killed there, or to put it in Western terms, subjects that are Islamophobic. I wondered for long on why that happened, 
Why is it that in other societies, religion did not get to have such a comeback? While in the Middle Eastern version of it, secularism was crushed 20 years later on to almost non-existence. There was a key difference between the two, the Western version and the Middle Eastern one. The earlier one did not push theocrats away at, the, at gunpoint, nor did it replace man-made gods with man-made political ones. But the change in the Middle East kept the people under the control of authoritarian regimes, the subjugation of the individual and the censorship of his thoughts were still an existing phenomena. And religion waited underneath the lie of a free society until it was time for it to come back to the surface. It can be argued that the secular authoritarian regimes are the reason for their own downfall. The authoritarian aspect of them denied any real freedom of expression and had entire nations as subjects to a selected few. This kept the ground fertile for any other totalitarian idea to control the masses, whether for, a great, for, a, for the sake of a great leader or a great god. So what was the next step in your journey? You, uh, I believe, founded a couple of organizations, first online and then actual. Could you please tell us about those groups? Well, first of all, uh, as anybody in Muslim majority countries, I don't know about in the United States, but I, I had this feeling that I'm on my own. Like, I'm the only atheist in Jordan. And then while I was surfing Facebook, I could see some hints from people uh, that I didn't know, putting these comments, some of them suggesting something secular. And then I started befriending them, and then we started exchanging and talking, and most of them were on fake names. And then I realized that I'm not by myself here. And there's a lot of atheists who are underground. And we started having groups on Facebook. And then we started meeting. And one meeting after the other, numbers began to grow. And it didn't turn into a much of a public uh, movement. Instead, it was a community, a place where you can feel home. Because if you go out and you be public about your atheism, you're, you're, you're nothing but an animal to your family, to your father, mother, to your, to your community, to everybody. The, the, the most common question you'll get asked is like, why wouldn't you sleep with your mother and sister if you don't believe? So huh. nobody it would even give you the, the respect of a human being because you, well, you, because you left the tribe, you know? Sure. You left the main identity. Because we might argue here, like, oh, our main identity is being an American, for example. But in, for, in a mentality of a Muslim, as far as I see, is the main identity is Islam more than anything else. And it doesn't mean a betrayal to all of anything else he can identify with, but it's the most important thing. And if, if you decide to leave that, then you're undermining what is more important to me, so I would be justified to hate you and even to kill you at one point. Yeah, and just to provide a bit of context, Jordan is not Saudi Arabia. It's not that conservative, but it's still fairly, a fairly conservative country, officially Muslim even. It's mm -hmm. not a secular country. And so even at the official level and as you were saying at the personal level, mm -hmm. there'd be extreme disapproval of anybody who's a free thinker or anybody who says, I'm no longer a Muslim. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. justified by law to have a lawsuit against you by any member of exactly. the country. Yeah. To that lawsuit would take away your civil rights. So you cannot marry. If you are married, your marriage is annulled. You cannot inherit. You lose all, all of these rights. Um, if, you are blas if you are blaspheming, yeah. that's another case where yes. you can go up to three years in prison. Yeah. And let alone the whole danger from the community itself when the official uh, charge for apostasy is carried out, usually by people who are not in the government and who are like regular people who you meet every day, which is the, the death penalty. That's a great story, Mohammed. And when we come back, we'll be talking with Mohammed Khadra about uh, a blasphemous, so to speak, incident in Jordan that actually led to the death of a free thinker.
Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name is Bill, and I'm an out-of-the-closet apatheist, meaning I don't really care what you believe, and I don't really think that you should care what I believe. I was raised in South Dakota in a strict Catholic family. I was an altar boy. I served Mass a lot of Sundays twice. We, the, the priest gave us this little card that said, in case of accident, please call a priest. I don't really like that idea anymore since I left the church about 40 years ago. Now, if you find me alongside the road after an accident, please call an ambulance and an EMT. Welcome back to Free Thought Matters. I'm here with Mohammed Kadra, who's of Jordanian background, of a Muslim background, who's now a free thinker and open non-believer. So, uh, Mohammed, you were talking about uh, blasphemy in Jordan. Uh, there was a very uh, shocking case about a year or two ago, which our viewers may not uh, necessarily remember. Nahed Hatar, uh, a Jordanian, was actually publicly killed while, uh, I believe, on the way to court because he had been charged with blasphemy just for distributing a cartoon that was seen as impious. Could you please tell us about the cartoon, about him, and the impact it had on you? Well, we heard that there's this cartoon that everybody is sharing, and then we found it, and it's just, it was mocking how ISIS views God. So it wasn't even talking about your everyday average Muslim. It has a terrorist guy sitting with the virgins and he's asking God to bring him some, I think, some food or drinks. So it was specifically talking about ISIS and Nahad Hatta also stated that in the post. Yeah. Yeah. And he, this is one of the reasons that, that scares you is that although it's talking about the, what, what most people would say, it's the, only the virgin of the fundamentalists. Yes. You have a whole country that grows up because of that. Yeah. Uh, so the government started looking for, uh, for him, and then they caught him. And afterward, he was charged with uh, blasphemy, which can lead him to three years in jail. He got out in bail, and he's now attending the court hearings. And while he was walking down the courthouse, an imam came to him and shot him three times and killed him. Shocking. Up to that point, we only heard stories about atheists getting killed in Pakistan, in yeah. Bangladesh, in Yemen, in Iraq. We never heard about a relevant story. and We never heard that somebody who walked the same street as I walked yeah. and had the same idea as I did getting killed. So it's, it's struck in us in a, point, in a way that although we sense that because the, there were, there were, there's this growing number, we sense that uh, like there's an environment for us, there's a community now, although we're not that public about it, but like we're family. And now that family is like watching over, like, oh wait, let's not contact each other now. So that, that like when you, you don't, you're not even publicly, publicly ex expressing something and you have that fear because of, something even in your head that you haven't even spoken about. I think that's the major effect that we had after, after his shooting. And th th that the sentence is already upon you from the moment you decided to leave and upon all of your best friends and now your second family. So you look at them and you never know when their time is up and when is yours. Did that lead to the passion and the anger that you had in you when you gave that wonderful speech in London? In 2017, uh, actually, FFRF co-presidents Dan Barker and Annie Laurie Gaylor were there, and they came back to the office and said, you know, here's this wonderful young Jordan, person of Jordanian background who's given the speech. That's how I first came to know about it. 
And I believe Richard Dawkins was part of that uh, conference also. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, the speech of yours has been really applauded. Can you tell us uh, about the speech a bit? Uh, what led you to uh, deliver it at such a public forum? And what was the impact of that? Well, be, before I spoke, I, there was a woman who was talking about that apostasy is not part of the, of the religion. Yeah. And before that, uh, London for me was, has, a, has a very special place because it was the first time I'm in what I thought is the free world. Sure. So when I landed, I was like, this is the place where you can say whatever and do whatever. So I'm happily wearing this badge that says, awesome without Allah. Yeah. And then we go to a place to have dinner before, that's, that's all before the, the talk. Certainly. And then this, this ex-Muslim girl who was with us, like she knows what does it, what does it mean to, wear, to be able to wear this. And she comes and takes it off and she told, tells me because there, those people in the restaurant are Muslim or might get in trouble. Yeah. So I'm like, how far, how, how free is this word yeah. that I thought is completely free? You know? And then I heard the cases about the hate speech, and people who even censor themselves. They don't sure. even need somebody to censor them. And you can relate that to Mahat Hattar, and that guy decided to say whatever he wanted to say, criticize a terrorist organization and their god, and got killed because of it. And those people would rather stay in silence, not, not speak their mind, although they have all the freedoms to do so. It struck me as a shock, and then I found, and found out that they would rather even censor those who came from the background that doesn't allow them to do so. And that's why uh, I, get, I, I spoke of what I spoke. And what did you speak about? What was the theme of the speech? It was about free speech and Islamophobia, which is, to me, is a de facto blasphemy law. Sure. Because... Uh, up until I left Jordan, I wasn't the animal, the pig, the kafir, the apostate, the person who should be put to death and all of that. But I was never an Islamophobe. Nobody would accuse me of Islamophobia back in Jordan. I could be the, the, I'm the worst person ever, but we don't have such things. Islamophobia sure. only exists the when there is no laws sure. to govern your speech. Sure. Then we will tell you that you're an Islamophobe, so the, you will do your own censoring. Sure. And it was actually emphasized by the Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah. And that's how it caught on to, to, to today's world. And that's why I, why I see that there is a, this high risk that, that you're sacrificing when you're, when you're giving up a freedom that, that is necessary for all of your other freedoms to exist. And it was a rousing speech. And what happened when you returned to Jordan after that? Well, I came back to Jordan uh, after a few days of the London Convention. And then my boss got to me in my off in his office, and he told me like, "What is this on YouTube that you're talking That's, about?" Yeah, Especially yeah. that I ended it with Islam being a virus. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then afterwards, friends of my friends yeah. were talking about it, yeah. and a friend of mine got a, a message uh, from an Irish number, weirdly, that says like, "Oh, you guys are going to be the next Nahid Hatta." And that's when I talked to the Council of Ex-Muslims of uh, Britain, yeah. who introduced me to Freedom From Religion Foundation sure. and other organizations, sure. and then that's when I left after, I think, two months of coming back to Jordan. Incredible. And so you left, and then you were in uh, England for a bit, or did you come directly to the United uh, States? I went, to, I went to the UK for a couple of weeks, and then I came back to the United States. Great. And uh, if I may ask, was there help provided uh, initially by... Uh, organizations like ours? The, I, I, uh, actually, it was the first was Freedom From Religion Foundation and the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. That's what allowed me to leave when I, had, when I had to leave. Any help afterwards came a few months after, after that. Okay. So you, I, I, I don't know what would have happened if it wasn't at that moment when Freedom From Religion Foundation and the Council of Britain said, like, okay, you can leave now. We will be helping you. Well, I mean, we're so glad to help, and especially in such a situation where a courageous uh, reformer and free thinker like you is caught in uh, uh, such a predicament. Uh, without getting into too much detail, uh, Mohammed Khadra, uh, what now? I mean, uh, where do you, uh, where are you now, and where do you envision uh, yourself to be, uh, including your activism? Well, I believe uh, 
the most the what made me what made it easier for me to leave was being a United States citizen. Sure. Now I left behind me hundreds of people who are sure. at risk in a lot of countries Certainly. who cannot do what I did and cannot simply just take up a flight and just leave. Yeah. Uh, I do want to work on that. I, I do want them to have an ability to live a life that now I can I can have. Um, that's one of the things I wanted to, to work on, but still, there, I've left everything behind me, so I'm still st st trying to stand on my own feet first, and then trying to help others. Because you, you lose your family, you lose your job, you lose your career, you lose everything you ever had, you just leave with one bag, and, and now in a, you're in a new country, new culture, new language, everything's new to you, so it, it's, it, it takes a little bit of a shock on you. Yes, uh, certainly. And how about uh, uh, remaining free thinkers in Jordan? Do they have any sort of uh, active organization still, or has that gone completely? Uh, there, there's there's uh, the online ex-Muslims of Jordan, sure, sure. which uh, I think it's going to be a platform to connect East and West and to try to provide people in the West who want to help in programs in the Middle East who can like directly go to there. Uh, there are still the the small communities that we had, uh, but still but the move uh, right now we have a, a couple of uh, Islamist uh, MPs who would actually force the government to do much more damage than usual. Like for example, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, I think two weeks ago, we had a convention about a new enlightenment in the religious speech. That's the title of the convention. And it was banned because the Muslim Brotherhood MP complained to the government that this is blasphemous. So even the idea of bringing a new change into just how the religious thinking should be was shut down. And uh, the, uh, you can also add that it wasn't, it wasn't Islamophobic. Yeah. Nobody accused it. Of that, <laughs> so. Well, so many obstacles, uh, so many barriers, but Thank you so much, Mohamed Khadra, for your courage and for being on our show uh, and for being at our convention in San Francisco. Mm -hmm.